esteemed colleagues and members of our virtual Navy Medicine family, I would like to thank you for joining us for our discussion on the Black Men and White Coats documentary. I am Captain Tony McRae, your diversity and inclusion Navy Medicine officer, and I have the distinct pleasure to serve as the moderator for today's event. Today's conversation will explore panel participants' views on issues highlighted in the AMA documentary, Black Men in White Coats, a film that creates awareness of the shortage of black men in the field of medicine and how the long-term impacts of historic and systemic racism in our nation have shaped this reality. It will also offer our panelists an opportunity to share experiences and barriers they have faced in their personal and professional journeys as physicians, dentists, and naval officers. And lastly, we will utilize their collective perspectives to identify solutions we can leverage to increase diversity, inclusion, and equity, and reduce health disparities in medicine. I encourage virtual participants to leave their questions, comments, and suggestions for future discussion topics in the chat. Before I present today's discussion panelists, I have the distinct honor to introduce the Surgeon General of the Navy, Rear Admiral Bruce Gillingham. Rear Admiral Gillingham understands the importance of diversity, inclusion, and equity, and has been leading the way to develop a culture of excellence within Navy medicine. I would like to thank Rear Admiral Gillingham for his enduring support of the principles of DEI and for being present with us today for this important discussion. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I present Rear Admiral Gillingham. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. And thank you, Captain McRae. Uh, if anybody deserves recognition, it's you for all of your efforts. And the fact that we're here today having this session is directly related to your efforts. So thank you so much. Distinguished panelists, Navy medicine team, both past, present, and future, thank you all for joining us today. Your participation in this critical discussion helps raise awareness regarding the need not only to increase representation in the medical workforce across our country, but also for designing and implementing strategies to bring us measurable and equal success within our Navy. I'd also like to thank the American Medical Association for selecting Navy Medicine, sponsor a screening of Black Men in White Coats documentary, and for bringing attention to the structural obstacles that make it challenging for minorities to become clinicians. I think we'd all agree that the last two years have demonstrated just how dynamic our mission can be and how important it is that we have the right people in place to meet these new challenges with sustained high reliability. One way that we can tip the odds in our favor is to draw from the broadest possible diversity of thought, experience, background, and talent and I truly believe that we need to cast our net as widely as possible to identify those high quality individuals across our active reserve civilian and contract workforce who have those qualities and make that commitment to identify the roadblocks to their success, give them the tools to be successful, and finally, to sustain that support so that they don't, quote, leak from the pipeline, end quote, as was pointed out by the documentary. Our, uh, our numbers in Navy medicine demonstrate where we need to be, although additional research is warranted in the military community. As the documentary demonstrated, this lack of wide representation can contribute to major gaps in health outcomes, including morbidity and mortality that are seen in communities of color. The COVID-19 pandemic has only amplified this disparity. Some specifics, within the United States, Black people make up approximately 13% of the population, but represent only 2% of all physicians and 2.6% of dentists, an underrepresentation that continues to this day within our medical and dental schools. 
Within Navy medicine, black officers make up 4.4% of the medical corps, 4.7% of the dental corps, and 8.3% of our overall Navy medical officers. We need to make a serious investment in increasing representation in the medical workforce and advancing inclusion within our communities. That starts by objectively assessing where we are today and how we got here and making a commitment to addressing those issues head on by developing executable solutions. And this problem extends beyond racial diversity, so we also need to open our aperture to look at other areas where we've not yet achieved parity and applied the same rigorous strategies and tangible incentives to address them as well. This issue not only impacts the public health of our nation, but has the potentially, potential rather to negatively affect both force medical readiness and our own medical force readiness. Optimizing diversity, inclusion, and equity across the board are critical for the success of our core mission and our credibility as leaders in our increasingly diverse and connected world. I ask you and I invite you to listen carefully to the perspectives of our accomplished panel of healthcare providers and military leaders who will be sharing their personal and professional stories, providing their insights and recommendations to accelerate our progress. We're hoping that the awareness that you glean from having watched the documentary and by listening to the panel discussion today will result in one of those aha moments that opens your eyes to new perspectives, sheds light on personal blind spots, and that reinforces your willingness to be an agent for positive transformation. As sailors in an emergency, we understand the power of the command, all hands on deck. The challenge before us is to make sure that the crew that responds to this order in the future is as broadly diverse and talented as we can make it. Thank you again, everyone, especially our distinguished panelists for your participation today, and I look forward to the discussion. Thank you, Rear Admiral Gillingham. Uh, before I begin, I would like to invite participants, I'm sorry, participants to watch the, the documentary trailer before we kick off our discussion today. We need more black men in white coats because we need to save the lives of more black men, period. <laughs> fewer black men applying to medical school in 2014 and in 1978. There are several medical schools that do not have any black men in their classrooms. When that is the case and we're in a learning environment, there's going to be different conclusions made about how to care for people if there are not diverse people around the table. You need to care about your fellow man and woman, otherwise we all suffer. So the reason why white people, white women should care about diversifying physician workforce, which includes black men, is because it makes it better for all of us. Historically, the system wasn't designed for black men to succeed. My mom, on and off drugs, in and out of jail my whole life, and becoming an orthopedic spine surgeon. If I can do it, come from that environment, everything that I went through, I think you can also. There are little black boys out there who see me on TV, who see me in this role, and who may not have ever thought that they could be a doctor, much less Surgeon General. But when they see that, all of a sudden think, I can do that too. We're approaching this as though it's a problem versus realizing that we have a crisis on our hands. What's the impact if this problem doesn't change? Black people are going to continue dying. Yeah, ain't no time for stressing. I've been really stacking. Yeah, if you want to go get it, stop playing around. Really got a wreck, say, playing around. If you want to go get it, stop playing around. Really got a wreck, say, playing around. Black like man, white cops, you'll be up right now. At this time, I'd like to introduce our panel members for today's discussion. I'll begin 
To my right, Captain Darrell Daniels, Medical Corps. Captain Daniels is a Navy General Surgeon currently assigned at the Pentagon as the Deputy Director, Medical Systems Integration and Combat Survivability. Welcome. Next, I'd like to introduce Captain Kevin Prince, Dental Corps. Captain Prince is a Navy dentist currently serving as the commanding officer at Naval Health Clinic Charleston. Welcome. Next, we have Captain Rodney Scott, also Dental Corps, United States Navy. Captain Scott is a Navy endodontist currently stationed at Bethesda, Maryland on the graduate endodontics program staff at the Naval Postgraduate Dental School. Thank you, Captain Scott, for joining us. And to my left, I'd like to present Captain Sharice White, Medical Corps. Captain White is a Navy orthopedic surgeon. She serves currently as the Deputy Department Head of Orthopedics and Rehabilitation and as the Medical Director for Inter-Service Phys Physician Assistance Program at Fort Belvoir Community Hospital. Welcome, Captain White. Next, I'd like to introduce Captain Sine Stefanos, Dental Corps. Captain Stefanos is a Navy orthodontic, dentist, sorry, currently serving at the Naval Hospital or Naval Health Clinic in Annapolis, Maryland. Welcome. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to present Captain Kevin Myers, United States Navy. Captain Myers is a surface warfare officer currently serving as the commanding officer of the Navy ROTC Na National Capital Area at George Washington University. Uh, welcome, Captain Myers. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I'd like to get this party started. All right? First question for my panelists. Please share with us today what or who motivated or influenced your decision to become a clinician, whether a physician or dentist, or to join the Navy? I'll begin my question with Captain Daniels. Thank you. Um, gosh, that was a long time ago. Um, I went to college to become a research biologist. Uh, I love science, um, really fell in love with biology. Uh, I was lucky enough to work in some labs uh, at Harvard, which was down the street from where I lived. Um, and I enjoyed the, the, the actual lab work, but I kind of missed the interaction with people. You're kind of by yourself. Uh, and then as I learned about applying for grants, to me that was similar to applying for financial aid. And I realized I did not want to spend my, the entire rest of my career applying for financial aid every year to get the grants. So I decided I was going to go to something that possibly was a little bit more lucrative, which was medicine, which also my biology degree would uh, be applicable to. So, uh, but to do that, I had to take the MCATs and everything. So I actually lost a year um, to, so I can take all the, the tests and apply to medical school. Uh, I spent a year working in a convenience store uh, and then was lucky enough to get admitted to medical school after that and, and matriculated. Wonderful. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Daniels. Captain Prince, yes. <laughs> so I, uh, for me, the, the seed was planted very early. I was about in the third or fourth grade. I was living in a public housing uh, place in Jacksonville, Florida. Uh, my third grade teacher took us to a dentist's office for a visit. I think she knew this dentist and uh, decided she was gonna take her class to the dentist's office for a visit. We went to the office. The seed was planted at that time for me. Now, I did not know how I was going to get there, but the seed was planted. And what I decided to do was continue to nurture that seed and see if there was a way to move forward in, in that career and in that profession. When I did finally get to the University of Florida and I got to dental school there, I met a retired Navy captain who was the dean of academic affairs at University of Florida. And I had a sidebar conversation with him one day about my future after completing my dental training. And he, he asked me, had you ever considered the Navy? I said, no, I hadn't. Um, as, as a matter of fact, I told him, 
and these are my words, exact words to him, I actually had a scholarship to West Point that I turned down because I didn't want to leave Florida to go to New York. <laughs> and so he looked at me and he was like, okay, that's a little bit odd. But anyway, had you ever considered the Navy? I was like, no, I did not. And he planted the seed again for something that I had not considered. And so I decided after, you know, my second year of dental school that I was going to join the Navy as a reservist and I started my Navy career after my second year of dental school. Thank you very much for sharing your story, Captain Prince. Sure. At this time, I'd like to turn the mic over to Captain Scott. <clears throat> I tell this story and people laugh, but um, my first exposure to, I guess, being a medical dental professional was my neighbor. I grew up in El Paso, Texas, so that's a predominantly Hispanic town, if you've ever been there. Um, my dad was in the Army. I don't hold that against him. That's where I, you know, the idea of joining the military was kind of prominent in my mind, but my neighbor was a dentist. He was a young black guy. He had a nice sports car. He had a, he had a nice house, and that was kind of my first introduction to, hey, this is something that I could do. He was a very, you know, well-respected in the community, and, and I guess that's where it planted the seed I surrounded myself with people who went to medical school, people who became lawyers, and kind of just got pulled along with a group of people that became very successful. So I think it really was about who I was surrounded by and who I found myself living next to that, that really planted a seed in my mind. Thank you, Captain Scott. This time I'd like to turn the mic over to Captain White. Ma'am. My mom was a nurse in the Air Force, and she went to nursing school when I was in preschool. I do remember that because I was about three when we were in the car waiting for her to get done with school, and my father asked my sister and me what we wanted to be when we grew up. Now, at three, I really didn't have any long-term plans. <laughs> and so <laughs> all I knew was that I didn't like waking up early and going to preschool, but my sister, who was six years older, said at the time that she wanted to be a teacher. That sounded like the worst idea in the world to someone who didn't even like waking up early to go to school. And so I said, I'll just be a nurse like mommy. And my father said something that turned out to be factually incorrect, but appeals to the sensibilities of a three-year-old when he said, um, nurses have to clean up messes. So why don't you be a doctor? Because they do all the same things, but they don't have to clean up messes. And I said, OK. And so that was the seed that was planted that Little Sharice is going to be a doctor, and over the years, uh, the community pretty much nurtured Sharice is going to be a doctor, and that's how I ended up deciding to go to medical school. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Captain White. Captain Stefanos, please share your journey. For me, it's like completely different. I, I grew up in Northeast Africa, and I never saw a doctor, let alone to dream about a doctor. So. Uh, I migrated here in 1990, and I started working. I had three jobs, three full-time jobs, and I tried to go full-time school. And it was extremely hard. And uh, on the third, my third job, I was working in 7-Eleven, and the manager asked me, like, hey, if you work from midnight to 7 o'clock, you get 25 cents extra. I said, damn, that's great. So let me work at midnight to 7 o'clock. So one recruiter came buying coffee, said, hey, why, why don't you go to school? I say, I'm going to school, but I can't afford because I have three jobs and I'm barely surviving. He said, like, join the Navy. They can pay for your school and they give you a place to stay. I said, are you sure or are you just pulling my leg? <laughs> he said, I'm 100% sure. I was so excited. And then I tell my brother, he said, like, hey, this guy told me uh, they can go, they can pay for my school. They give me a place to stay and you go full time, but he say like, no, they put in your leg. I say, no. He came the next day, I say like, you know what, man, I'm gonna join. So he gave me all the paperwork, and I joined the Navy, and uh, I became a dental tech. So I became a dental tech, E1. They told me like, what do you wanna pick? I said, I have no clue about dental tech. I was to be a nuclear physicist, and they say, no, you can't do that. I said, okay, what can I be? Be a dental tech. I said, okay, I pick dental tech. And uh, I did my A school. I went to Norfolk. And 
for amazing things. The doctor that I work with, I can list them. And, and one of them is here, as a panel was asked, Captain Prince. <laughs> I was his tech a long time ago. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Prince. <laughs> So I was his tech, and I had Captain Bryant, a lot of doctors that helped me out. He said, Captain Bryant told me, like, hey, you can become a doctor. I say, are you sure I can become a doctor? He said, yes. So he put my package. I applied one school because I have no idea. And he sent me to his school. All right, finished my school. And then I did uh, my uh, ortho program. And think about this. Now, I'm going to give you, this is amazing. Not only did become, I became a dentist, and I became a part of the presidential team to serve the president's family and the president. So if there is a way, that if there is a dream, there is a way. And the Navy made me to become a dentist and a doctor. Oh, well, thank you for that, for that powerful uh Journey, journey. Uh, thank okay. you. Thank I you. definitely uh, think our uh, our panel members and our uh, constituents out in uh, in virtual virtual world uh, appreciate hearing that story. Thank he you. was an amazing dental tech, didn't he? <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And last but certainly not least, I'd like to uh, turn the mic over to Captain Kevin Myers. Right. Uh, thank you. Um, so I'm not a clinician, obviously, but uh, what drove me to enlist in the Navy before I got commissioned was uh, I was growing up in Baltimore City right around the time Bethlehem Steel just about went bankrupt and the steel industry went bust, and there was really not a lot to do. Uh, all the generations in my family before me had all worked somewhere around the steel industry. So the, the Navy seemed like an interesting uh, thing to do, and it was a way to get over to the West Coast and see my brother who had, uh, who had been in the Navy. That was really my only objective. I didn't have any lofty goals um, and really thought I would do a few years and be done with it. And here I am at you know, 34 years and going on. Now, um, if I can skew the question, well, what drives me to want to be here for the, for the panel today, besides George Washington University ROTC, part of our <coughs> consortium includes Catholic and Georgetown and Howard University. And we have very few students at Howard, and we have one uh, nursing uh, major at Howard who, uh, sadly, when she enlisted or when she enrolled for the nursing application, did not go under the nursing application. She went under the standard unrestricted line application. Mm -hmm. So we are struggling to get her scholarship funded because they are different streams. It's a very complicated uh, situation. And so tragically, there's, there's a chance that she won't won't be able to make it. And it dawns on me, I don't have a lot of professors in naval science to reach out to because the three African-American PNSs all retired last year. Uh, and so I think if I don't involve myself in panels, I am just out of touch and I want to be in touch because all these midshipmen, all these high school students crossing over to be uh, ensigns or second lieutenants are somehow looking to me to have the answers. So I need to go get the answers. Thank you, Captain Myers, for, uh, for your story and sharing uh, why you support this conversation and our STEM efforts, uh, not only across Navy medicine, but within the Navy itself. So thank you. So at this time, I'd like to uh, transition and have a quick discussion about the documentary itself. So I'd like to begin off with the question relevant to the documentary. And so it, it dissects the systemic barriers preventing black men and women from becoming medical doctors and the consequences on society as a, as a large. And so in order of introduction, and so Captain Daniels, you get put on the spot again, um, I would like to hear your views on the documentary and the black men in white coats movement. Now, for the sake of time, I am going to ask that the panel members kind of piggyback off of one another because I want to try to get through the rest of the questions. So, sure. Captain Daniels, I'll begin with you. Uh, thank you. Um, I thought it was a great documentary. It was, it was just very interesting to hear what they were saying. But in some ways it made me kind of sad because it, was, it reminded me that this is not a new problem. 
They talk about uh, the 2% going back to 1978. You know, in reality, it was 2% back in 1920. Um, the, the, the idea of trying to get black men in white coats is, is almost a 200-year-old problem. The first African-American male to graduate from medical school in America, well, in America, had to actually go to Scotland to get his degree because none of the American medical schools would accept him. There were a group of students over at Harvard uh, that were actually matriculated, but they ended up having to leave the school because the white students protested, uh, and so they were asked to leave. When I was in medical school, I did a thesis, African Americans at the Yale University School of Medicine, 1810 to 1960, where I looked at the first 150 years of African American students at Yale. And if you Google my name, you'll probably come up with it. It usually, uh, the search engine finds it. What I found was that the interest in having African American students ebbed and flowed over the years. At some points in, in Yale's history, we welcomed them with open arms. Uh, at another point in Yale's history, we actually had an unwritten policy to prevent uh, black doctors and nurses, or black people from becoming doctors and nurses at Yale. So that, you know, writing that thesis really, really taught me something, and this is a, a continuing struggle. Um, and so seeing this movie reminded me of that and reminded me that of all the progress that still needs to be made. Uh, and it, but it was great to see another generation of leadership coming in and, and taking on that challenge because it's something that is critically important to our country. Wonderful, thank you. Would anyone else like to join in? Yeah, I, I think two of the most powerful scenes in the documentary for me were the uh, barbershop scene, which was one that I thought was pretty, pretty powerful. Uh, back when I used to have hair, I used to go to barbershops and, and, <laughs> and get my hair cut. And I can tell you, we saw world hunger, we saw poverty, we sent people to Neptune uh, in that barbershop during that time that I was there getting my hair cut. So I know it's a, it's a laboratory for ideas and, and thought. Uh, so I, I, I think that uh, that was a powerful scene to me. I think some of the back and forth between the two physicians there about the responsibility of medical schools versus the responsibility of the community. I thought that was a powerful scene, but you know, for me, it's an all of the above type of option and not one or the other. Um, and I thought looking, I was specifically looking at the pre-med student who was sitting there because what I was doing was looking at his, his body language, his posture during this conversation. And what I thought I saw, at least from my view, was a person who realized that the burden of being a, a black physician or black health professional was now going to be falling on him. That baton was going to be passed to him. And he was going to have to deal with that burden and deal with uh, the, the things that will come with the challenges of, of, of having that baton in his hand. The second scene that was most powerful to me was a last scene towards the end of the documentary where this young man, I think his name was Tripp, he, he ran up to a group of black physicians that were sitting there sort of having a conversation or standing there, and they embraced him. They put the white coat on him. They put the stethoscope around his neck, and they embraced him. And I thought at that point what they were doing was, was pouring their wisdom, their knowledge. They were planting a seed for this young man. And I felt that was a very powerful part of this documentary. So for me, those are the two very powerful portions. Thank you, Captain Prince. Uh, I'll, I'll turn the mic over to you. Um, that scene was very powerful at the end because, I mean, you could just feel the weight of, I don't know who was pushing down on this young man's dream, but you could just feel him, just the weight of it weighing on his shoulders. And it just reminds me that I, it's still, unfortunately, too rare for me to see people like me, right? I know most of the people who wear, you know, uh, eagles on their collars, who are doctors and dentists in this area, and, and you get used to being the one of only or one of a few. And so I just think a documentary like this reminds us that it's a problem that we all need to be aware of. Um, we need to let people know that there are opportunities for you, and people who look like me, who look like us, have to be out there reminding people that, that you can achieve if, if, you, if you try, and if you know that it's a possibility for you, so. Okay. So I'm gonna transition to this side of the room, but I'm gonna move on to the next question uh, for the sake of keeping things going. 
So during the film, there was a discussion that Captain Prince talked about that took place in the barber shop, where Dr. Dale implied that the trajectory to increasing black male representation should start with the medical schools, accepting one more black male. Captain White, what are your thoughts about that statement? I think it's too late by that point because the reason why there aren't more black male doctors is not because med schools aren't letting them in. It's because their dream is getting killed before they even get to that point. Um, I was in a science and technology program in high school and a lot of us at the school were in that program. Um, my high school class had about 600 kids in it and I'd say about 200 of us were in the science and tech program in my high school class, but only four of them were black men. And I went to high school in Prince George's County, which is 65% African American just by population as a whole. And so I think we need to start thinking a little bit earlier as to how we get more black men to go to medical school. And it starts with, you know, why with this huge concentration of black men that are just in the community, why are they filtered out of programs that are STEM based? And then once you do have them there, how are they filtered out in college? And so I, I think the adding one more black male per med school class is a great idea. But again, I think at that point, you've already missed the people that you could have captured had you started six, seven years earlier. Thank you, Captain White. So Captain Stefanos, I, I'd like to add on to that a little bit because I think there, there may be a perception that adding one more black man to a class sort of, um, how can I put it, uh, makes it look like we're not competent and qualified to be there, so that it's a token or bringing back some type of affirmative action. What are your thoughts on that? So I think for me, what I, what I see, like if you add one person in medical school, okay, let's expand it. Why we should keep it that way? What can we say like, okay, how many uh, African-American enlisted do we have in the Navy? What if we say like, hey, can we put 2% of those enlisted, put them in a medical school? That will give us, if let's, for us, for example, let's say if we have 20,000, let's, let's say, hey, can we take 2%? This is the one we can impact directly. We don't have to go and look for people. These people are just like Captain Priest. I work next to him. He helped me out. So if we can focus that the one we can touch and get 2%, of our enlisted to medical school. Because we know if they go through A school, they, can have, they are good enough to apply to any medical school. So we can expand it. So using just one, it looks like we are limiting to one, uh, one solution to the big problem. So we need to expand it more, say like, okay, let's get 2% uh, from our enlisted. How about 5% from our enlisted? Uh, give them the tools that they can join the medical force. So the idea is great. If they can add one medical student, is great because sometimes you need to put your fit to the medical school. So add, if you can get in, I know 100%, they will graduate. So that one is, giving one is a good start, but that's not the end. That is a step. We can expand that to a lot of fields. We can say, how about 10% for our enlisted? How about um, 3%? And um, you know, our, we have a standard uh, exams that doesn't help us either. So we got to make sure when we recruit these people, they we have to match to the program so that we can have access to the medical schools. So having access is the problem. We have a lot of uh, outstanding uh, students, but we don't have access. That access we needed. So if they give me one more doctor, hey, great. What about 2% from our enlisted guys? So we need to expand it. We didn't need to limit ourselves to just one type of expo exposure to the medical field. Thank you. Yeah. Captain Myers, I'd like to hear your perspective on the question. Sure. Thank you. Well, uh, Captain White mentioned, you know, it's a little bit late if you're just trying to add one more. And I would, I would agree with that if I went back a little bit in the sequence for people trying to come into ROTC program. They'll either 
ask a high school counselor or they'll go to a recruiting office or maybe they'll find it uh, on the internet. Now that application is skewed uh, to things like an SAT or ACT score, a grade point average, and then these leadership tick marks, which for us now count up to 40%. And when you look in the checklist, there are things like, are they in the Boy Scouts? Are they in the Eagle Scouts? Do they belong to various societies? And in my mind, this is really skewed more toward a suburban uh, type of environment and not someone who's growing up in, uh, in a major city or an urban environment. And so it is one of the things we look at for our uh, Naval Service Training Command. How can we do a whole of person uh, approach? Because you have people exercising leadership. Uh, some of these young people are single parent families and they're taking care of younger brothers or sisters. And how do you credit that? so that they can at least get in the door and be accepted to a university. And then, you know, uh, medical, dental programs, those become more readily available. Thank you, I appreciate that. So I'd like to, that one, yeah, of course, sir. I, I, I think um, there's a critical time frame for, for African American men, and this is just my opinion, in my opinion only. I think there's a critical time frame between grades five through nine, where you have to really hone in and target African American men and try to move the ball forward as far as that's concerned because that's a time frame when you see a lot of young African American men start to look at formulating their opinions about the world and about things around them and their environment. And that is a quick, inc very inquisitive time frame for African American men. So I think I agree with Captain White when she says, you know, it's too late when you get to that point. I think you have to do this earlier and you have to target your, your resources to that critical, key critical time when your people are still, these young men are still formulating their thoughts about themselves, about the world around them, and also about how do, how do, you, how do you make athletics and academics coexist, and can you do that? Because a lot of times in our communities, and I can't speak for everyone in general, from my opinion, a lot of times for us is there's a lot of concentration placed on athletics and having athletic success. And how do you let these young men know, no, it's not about just about athletics, but it's also about academics and having an academic success. And how do we, how do we foster that and facilitate that so that they understand? So for me, it's, it's in agreement with what Captain White said, it's that critical time frame between grades five and nine when you really have to make a, a targeted difference uh, in the lives of these young men. Um, and uh, I, I put together a point paper that I share with the panel that sort of talks a little bit about that. Thank you, uh, Captain Prince. So Captain White, I'm gonna ask you the next question. And so in the documentary, um, Dr. Dale kind of talked, he, he was engaging in conversation, but he started off with a profound statement. He said, if you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. So as a black female clinician and leader, do you feel your voice is represented at the table? No, um, that's the short answer. Long answer is because when you go to, when you have the opportunity to be in the room um, and over the course of my career, I've had uh, the chance to be chairs of a lot of committees where I have to present to the board of directors. I walk in the room and I am the only person in the room who looks like me. And that's okay, I guess. But um, an experience that is mine is hard to convey um, to a panel of people who make decisions for me if they don't understand how my journey is a little bit different from theirs. Um, and so it's interesting, I will say, um, to navigate that um, because you understand that the, the path for you to be in the room is not going to be the same. And so you don't even know who to ask to get in the room because that person will give you advice that worked for them. And you know very well that once you hear that advice that it is never going to work for you. And so you have to carve your own path. And so it takes you a little bit longer. Um, for some people, they decide that that's not the path they want to choose because it is more difficult. And so they don't necessarily give up, just decide it's not for them. And it just makes it harder uh, to get in the room. And so 
it's a self-perpetuating issue that hopefully if more people just stick to it will fix, I don't know when, um, but hopefully at some point it doesn't become as difficult to be in the room. Thank you. So I'd like to ask the next question of uh, Captain Scott, uh, because earlier in the conversation, you kind of alluded to this. And so I want you to consider the comment that was made by Dr. Wale relevant to the weight of being one of the few uh, minorities or black doctors or dentists in the healthcare setting. Have you ever felt that you were representing more than just yourself, either at work, at school, in your community, or even in Navy medicine? Uh, yes, every day. Um, my specialty, um, I'm the second person ever to graduate from the Naval Postgraduate Dental School in my specialty, and the last one was back in the 80s. So um, that, to me, says a lot. I'm the only African American currently on staff in the dental school. So. I have, over my career, interacted with dental technicians, with patients uh, who often, you know, walk in the room and assume I'm the assistant, you know, not so much now that I have gray hair, but before. Uh, so yeah, I feel like uh, there's, there's a responsibility on me to represent my profession, my race, my ideas about the world, and always feel like I'm kind of obligated to be a good example and, and put myself out there with things like this um, so that I can, again, be an example for, for how you can succeed regardless of where you come from or, or, what, or what your opportunities have been throughout your life. Now, thank you. And, and so, Dr. Daniels, before you speak, <laughs> I, um, I definitely want to know, I want to share something with you that you may not know. So I've been in the Navy for almost 37 years, and I worked with you at Balboa. And do you know that you're the first black physician that I ever saw in my entire Navy career? Oh, my career? gosh. So the, you were the unicorn. Uh, in my, my little fantasy world while I served in San Diego. But I'd like to hear your perspective on this, this very question as well. Well, thanks. Um, wow. <laughs> uh, I'm glad you gave that answer because if you asked me the same question, my answer would be absolutely. And I agree with you. It is on a daily basis. When I became the DSS, the Chief of Surgery at Balboa, um, in fact, right after I, you left, sir, I was walking to my office, it's like the first day or so, and I ran into one of the custodians, and she said, it's great to see people like you in the office. And I'm, what, what do you mean? She said, she, people with dark skin. And it dawned on me that, you know, it's not just, you know, each other, the other doctors and nurses. I mean, this is the custodial staff, and they're watching. They're looking at what's going on around them. And then when I went to Fleet Forces, one of my corpsmen was talking to another corpsman who said that she was happy to hear that I got uh, appointed to Fleet Forces because I was the first African American to ever hold the position. And I hadn't really thought of it like that, but you know, that's the corpsman saying, okay, we're watching these positions and, and what's happening. So uh, yes, it's not only just you know, a intangible thing, it, it is you know, concrete examples of people assessing what's going on and looking at you know, those of us at, at, the, at the panel here saying, what, what have they achieved and what other achievements have not been made yet that we're looking for? Oh, so thank absolutely. You. Thank you very much. So I'm going to um, kind of transition into some additional questions. But so what can we do either correctly and collectively to influence the next generation of medical providers and to change that stadium mentality, that sort of stadium to stage mentality that exists and pressures our minority uh, um, constituents not to pursue uh, careers in STEM, but to choose athletics and entertainment. So what can we do about that? What should we be doing about that? Do I have any takers? Yeah, I'll take it. Okay. So I think, um, I think the documentary sort of 
spelled that out pretty pretty clearly. You know, we, we have to we have to go into these communities. We have to target these young men at that critical point that I talked about and show them something other than athletics. We have to show them that there are men, black men, African American men in this in this community in this world that are doing things outside of athletics and and and, and outside of entertainment. And so I think the documentary really spells that out quite clearly. The, the, the question is, do, do we have the, the will and the courage to put the investments in that are going to be required to make that happen? Knowing that the return on investment may take a while, do we have the will and the courage to do that? I think that's the question at hand. And I think that it's, it's going to be even more challenging than that because I remember uh, a show I was watching, I forget what it, exactly it was, but they asked a, a young woman, young black woman, what did she want to be when she grew up? And her answer was a thug. Wh why? I mean, it just, just blew my mind. That's, my, that's what she wanted to be when you grew up, but that's what she saw around her, so you know, that's what she you know, achieved. Um, we've got to make sure that you know, it's not only the athletes and the, and the entertainers, but you know, the doctors and nurses the, the rock stars, you know, sure. the people who achieve, the people who own corporations, those are the rock stars. Show them there's an alternative. And, and no, you don't have to, you know, expect to be dead by 25. You know, there, there's a different world out there. We just need to, you know, show it to them. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think, uh, I think the responsibility lies into us because there are a lot of programs in, for example, in the Navy that help our enlisted, uh, a lot of programs that we put them just for the heck of it. We, we don't engage ourselves, uh, the, the programs that we have, we put them just for, for say, for just for sake that we have these programs. And instead, as taking responsibility, using all the, 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 res the utility that we have and give them to the kids. I can give a simple example. For example, we had a program at uh, UPenn when I was a student, the minority kids that you bring them to the school. So we brought 12 students to the program, out of the 12 students, three students became a dentist. They were ninth grade students. So we have a lot of this program that will help our minority, but they are only entitled. So we need to use those programs so that we can utilize them and recruit people and give them that uh, exposure to the programs. So we need to work a little bit harder. The leadership, everybody should work harder with all the programs that we have to utilize them and give them access to the people that need them the most. So we need. Yeah. Like to add into this, Tom? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, you know, a, a, a lot of energy, it seems, in the last you know few years has gone into highlighting a problem that for some of us have known it's always been there for decades, at least as long as I've been in Navy medicine. and. Um, because I remember as a medical student rotating at various hospitals and various departments and trying to figure out what I wanted to be when I grew up and I remember distinctly being a medical student at San Diego and seeing no other officers of color, period. No nurses, no doctors, no medical service corps, like none, zero, for the entire six week rotation. And um, that kind of skews how you think you would fit into an organization if you don't see anyone who looks like you and so as much extra work as it seems, you know, to get this panel together, I think for people that are junior to us to do more work out in the community so that people see you. Um, because I don't, I believe in this, the saying, you can't be what you can't see. Um, I didn't listen to it, obviously, because there were no black women orthopedic surgeons when I decided to become one in the Navy. But I, <laughs> but I did it. Now, I'm not the first. I'm not taking that away uh, from the person who was. But it's, it's, for someone who's not as idealistic as me, it's hard to conceptualize yourself in a setting if you've never seen it before. And so I, I think the challenge becomes what are the other providers of color, um, of all ethnicities, and it, it, even the ones that are not in um, an underrepresented minority, you have to really go out and reach these kids. And for the people that are not black or brown, it's gonna be a little bit more difficult to reach those kids, but you have to try because there's not enough of us to do it by ourselves. 
And so I think the energy that we're putting into highlighting the problem needs to go into actually fixing it. Thank you, Captain White. And so I know we're, we're kind of running out of time, but I think it's important that we uh, kind of end this conversation with uh, some education and offering of resources to our constituents that are on the, on the line and out in uh, virtual world. So what programs are you aware of that are available to help individuals who want to become doctors, who want to become dentists, um, but may, may not have the resources or the finances to be able to support paying for college or medical school? And so I'm gonna start with you, Captain Myers, because I know you know some resources and you got the insights. And, uh, sure. <laughs> um, and so just one side note for the, for the last one, if I could, in terms of what we can collectively take a look at uh, across all ROTC units nationwide, if I looked at surface warfare uh, scholarships awarded per year, it's about 280. Same thing with aviation side, submarines a little bit less. Anybody care to guess how many nurse scholarships we offer out per year? Somewhere between nine or 10. Okay, so you won't get, and that's, that's not targeted to any community, that's just nine or 10. A few more for medical community. So. Uh, it is a complicated formula to arrive at how we decide those numbers, but I think that would be a good, how do we get at those numbers? And if you offer more, you, you, know, you will get more. Um, each of the universities that I belong with, within their medical programs, and George Washington has a very robust one, that's the one I'm most familiar with, they actually have a medical diversity uh, inclusion subset specifically targeting local high schools in the area and trying to get more people uh, to come in. Now, that doesn't help them with the financial side. The financial side is either going to come through service academies or uh, ROTC. Um, there are forums online to help people fill out the applications, but if there's anybody who has, you know, children of high school age getting ready to go through colleges, I would recommend that they call any of the ROTC uh, universities that are close to them, their numbers are published, and if you don't wanna do that, then call mine, because uh, we'll, we'll help you get through that process. We find if we shepherd someone through an application process, the success rate is exponentially higher than if they're sitting at home trying to figure out how to do these, uh, do these things uh, online. Um, and the financial aid programs depends on you know the region. That's a little more complicated uh, situation, but we've actually found active duty and reserve personnel who will come over and ask us how they can apply their GI Bill benefits. They have them, or their children or parents, and they're just not sure how to do it. And every university has an office set up to do that, but finding that sometimes is the uh, uh, is the challenge uh, for them. So. Um, these are just a few things you know. I recommend, obviously not targeted just to the medical uh, community, uh, but I think uh, anything that's gonna help uh, ROTC in general would also help uh, medical programs. Thank you, Captain Myers. Would anyone else like to uh, offer any other additional resources? I think, I think I will say uh, that is for medical and dental school, there are a lot of programs that can help you. And one that I know it works, as I put a lot of people to that program is the HPSP program, if like we need uh, the leadership, uh, from the leadership, we need to work hard to get this information to the undergrad students that are willing and able to go to medical and dental school. And the HPSP program pays for your school tuition and boarding, and you get a pocket money. There is no other way, I mean like, this is like a free money that you can use, you become a doctor. And it's four, 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 you, say, you go to school for four years, you get you serve four years and you are done. So the HPSP program is an excellent program. If you don't have money, if you don't want to go through a loan, this programs work especially especially for the minority. And the leadership, we need to work harder to reach out to people to use these programs. So that's. And I guess I would also add. Um, for those of us who didn't go through HPSP or one of those programs, um, make sure we educate people on what to do financially after they finish medical school. Because either the day after you finish medical school or, or residency, suddenly you're sitting there and 
I mean, I was lucky. I only had a hundred thousand dollars in debt, but exactly. now it's more like a quarter million, and that's right. that's nothing to shake, you know, yes. shake a, a turkey leg at. And so, knowing how to manage finances, knowing uh, coming up with a financial plan, maybe deferring uh, getting a mortgage on the house for a couple of years so you can start paying some of that down early, um, things like that. It would have been great for somebody to be able to sit down with me and, and tell me what to do because, you know, I, I finished my residency, got in a plane, went to Okinawa, and I was literally on my own trying to work that out. So that would be my offer. No, thank you for that, perspe um, that perspective. So ladies and gentlemen, I know we're running out of time. I, I see my group back there giving me the eye. So hey, I'd like to thank each of you for joining us today for the discussion on the American Medical Association sponsored documentary, Black Men in White Coats. As medical personnel, we know that diversity, inclusion, and equity across our healthcare system and within our Navy is crucial to our mission and to the preservation of health and readiness of our force. Navy medicine, as our Surgeon General stated, remains committed to developing a culture of excellence. This includes increasing awareness of the areas of health care and within our organization whereby diversity, inclusion, and equity may be lacking. We know that with our shared reserve and resolve, we can and we will increase diverse representation amongst healthcare providers, not only in our nation, and cultivate an environment of inclusion and equity within our Navy medicine team. This ends our event for today. I invite each of you to participate in future discussion events, which will be launched in 2022 as part of the Surgeon General's Dive In Diversity, Inclusion, Virtual Expression Series. And I thank you and I thank the Surgeon General today for the opportunity to host this, this discussion, which is the first time in Navy medicine this has ever been done. And it sets the stage for possibility of what we can do when we collectively put our minds together. So on behalf of the Surgeon General and, and the Navy medicine diversity inclusion program, thank you for your time and participation in today's event.